Matthew chapter number 13 is a, uh, a chapter that's very unique. Uh, there are seven different parables in this chapter. A parable is a earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And Jesus used practical things to expound heavenly truths. And isn't it amazing, even today, he'll allow us to see some great heavenly truth in a practical, everyday manner. And so in Matthew chapter number 13, there's a thought I want to glean from uh, these verses, and I'm interested in begin reading verse number 3. The Bible says, And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed some seeds, or when he sowed some seeds, fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. When the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, we're thankful for the Word of God. We're thankful, Lord, you're the God on the mountain. But, Lord, you're also the God in the valleys. Lord, we're thankful a little much when God's in it. We're thankful to be in church tonight. Now, Lord, I pray you'd help us. You know what we stand in need of. Speak to our hearts. Glorify your name's sake. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' holy name we do pray. Amen. Amen. We find here in this parable, Jesus is talking about a sower sowing seeds. And the emphasis is on the types of ground that the seeds uh, find themselves. Now, can I say the seed is a picture of the Word of God. And every time that the man of God stands and he proclaims the Word of God, or every time a teacher stands and teaches the Word of God, or every time somebody shares the Word of God with somebody in their family or somebody on the job, uh, every time somebody hands out a gospel tract, there are seeds being sown. And my dear friends, the Word of God never returns void. It always accomplishes something for the glory of God. You say, Brother Doug, what if somebody takes the track, they don't read it, they wad it up, they throw it in the garbage. Uh, how in the world does God get glory from that? Because one of these days, if those people never get saved, uh, they're going to stand before God at the great white throne judgment, uh, and God, they're not going to be able to say to God, nobody ever told me. Uh, God will remind them of that track they threw away that was the very, very thing they needed to have eternal life. Uh, can I say this? That... We find four different types of ground. Can I say that man was formed from the dust of the ground? So Jesus uses the earth to illustrate types of hearts that the seed is sown towards. Now, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time here dealing with what these grounds represent, but I do want to share the ground that the seed was sown in or sown towards. Can I say first of all that when the seed goes forth, some are sideways. Look what it says in verse number th uh, four. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside and the fowls came and devoured them up. They're sideways. Uh, the word of God goes forth and it offends people. Can I say there are some people get sideways with the Word of God? There are some people you try to tell them they need to get born again and they'll tell you not to judge them. Who are you to tell them what they need? And they get offended. They get sideways. Uh, 
because they think you're judging them when uh, what you're really doing them is showing them the greatest love that could ever be shown to them. Uh, you are showing them how they can have eternal life, uh, how their sins can be forgiven, uh, how they can have a new life in Christ, uh, the best life they could ever live. Uh, you're not judging them. Uh, my dear friends, it doesn't matter uh, if somebody's lost and they've been raised in church uh, or if somebody's the biggest drunk uh, or the, uh, the biggest gutter rat in the world. Uh, everybody needs to be saved. Uh, and God's no respecter of person. But there are some people who get sideways. So much so is your family members. See, your family members, when you're as big as heathen as they were, or they are, and they don't like you telling them that you, they need what you got. They'll even tell you, well, if religion works for you, that's fine, leave me alone. I remember when you used to do what I'm doing. Right. Yeah, but I'm not doing it no more because right. I met the master. Right. But they'll get sideways with you. Used to, it was a well-known statement, you could talk about anything but politics and religion. Mm -mm. Those people don't want to hear what the Word of God says. You know why? Because inherently, man's conscience reveals them they're not right with God. And they don't want you to remind them of it. So there are some who get sideways and notice the fowls come and devour that seed. When somebody closes their heart to the Word of God, when they get sideways, when they get mad or aggravated uh, 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 for somebody sharing them with the Word of God. Notice the fowls come and devours the seed. The seed doesn't penetrate their heart, their bitter heart. And I preached one time about all them fowls, and I'm not going to bring them back up, but there's all kinds of fowls waiting around to, uh, to devour the seed. The devil's got imps everywhere, and there's all kinds of bird brains around trying to, trying to devour seed. And my favorite's the buzzard. They always feast on dead things. But anyway... And some are sideways. Notice some, when the word of God goes forth, they're stony. Look at verse number 5. Some fell upon stony places, and they had not much earth. And forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. When the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, uh, they withered away. Can I say there are some people who are hard-hearted? Mm. They're stony. And uh, uh, can I say something about hard-hearted people? They're full of pride. And folks full of pride won't humble themselves. Can I say, you're never truly going to know the Lord Jesus as your Savior till you get broken and you humble yourself for God. Now, there's a lot of commentators that will say that this is somebody that doesn't get saved, they're a lost person, the Word of God doesn't penetrate them, uh, they get around the Word of God enough to know some of the Word of God, know a little bit about the Word of God, uh, uh, they've heard the term born again, they've heard uh, certain terms from the Word of God, but the Word of God never takes root in their heart, uh, and when any, any, any heat gets on, they're gone. Other commentators say, well, somebody gets saved, but they don't grow in the Lord, and then they get gone. I don't know about that. Hmm? Can I say tonight there's a whole bunch of folks out there that are real good about making people to get make professions. There's a big difference between a profession and a possession. Hmm? I could tell you I'm seven feet tall, but I'm not seven feet tall. Hmm? Uh, Brother Bob carries a little piece of paper around in his Bible. It shows the distance between his head and his heart. That's the difference between a profession and a possession. It's people that have the mind, the head knowledge of the things of God, and there's other people that's got the heart knowledge. When somebody knows the Lord, I'm not saying they won't step in a mud puddle every now and then. I won't say they won't have problems. I won't even say they'll get, they won't get out of church, but i tell you one thing, church won't get out of them. There's a difference. Uh... We see some are sideways, some are stony, some are stifled. Look at verse 7. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. Can I say there are some where the, the seed is received, but they, they're around a bunch of thorns, and the thorns choke them. 
Now, can I say that your environment has a whole lot to do with your spirituality? If you live in an environment where the only church you get is when you're at church, and when you go home or you go uh, uh, to your environment, uh, maybe it's your work environment, your home environment, uh, and all your rounds vile people uh, with vile mouths uh, and vile lifestyles, uh, it will absolutely vex the Word of God in your life. It will vex the Spirit of God in your life. When you've got a family that loves God and goes to church with you, you ought to be thankful. There are so many folks that their environment around them chokes out what they get on Sunday. By Wednesday, they're empty. And they've got to get filled back up. And then we got the sold-out crowd. Notice the sold-out crowd, verse number 8. But other fell into good ground. Hallelujah for that good ground crowd. Let me just say this, that good ground crowd, uh, uh, I'm not saying everybody comes Wednesday night's good ground, but I'm going to tell you those that come out Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, they're a good candidate to be good ground. Are you listening? Uh, that good ground. Mm, and they brought forth fruit. Some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Hmm? Can I say it doesn't matter who was bringing 30, 60, or 100. What mattered is they was bringing forth fruit. Huh? Can I say, not everybody has the uh, same opportunities. It doesn't matter if you're a 30-fold or a 100-fold Christian. What matters is if you're a fruitful Christian. Hmm? There's some that desire to be a hundredfold, but because of maybe their physical limitations or maybe uh, other limitations, uh, they can't be a hundredfold. They're only a sixtyfold. But you know what? God doesn't care about the sixty, hundred, thirty. He cares about you bringing forth fruit. Huh? That's the important thing. Now listen, we get in trouble when we get to looking around and trying to determine who's a thirty, who's a sixty, and who's a hundred. That's not our job. That's the Lord's job. Huh? And you don't see what goes on in secret. You don't see that one that's up 4 o'clock in the morning praying. You don't see that one that's out uh, 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 passing out tracks when nobody's looking. You don't know uh, who's uh, producing the fruit. But we got one who does. Huh? Thank God for that sold out crowd. Now I find it amazing. Out of the four different types of soil... Only one's productive. One out of four. 25%. That's not a good ratio. Back when I was in the business world, if uh, 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 my sales staff of 100 and I only had 25 selling, guess what? 75 be looking for a job. You know what I'm saying? Was, I, I need some production out of you. We got... Uh, uh, product to move and bills to pay and if you're going to be dead weight you need to go on uh, but see in the church world where everybody's perceived as volunteers uh, we're just glad to see everybody but can I say there's coming a day when the Lord's going to look down on them three that didn't produce I want to be in that 25 percentile don't you I want to be in that crowd that's productive for Jesus. Hmm? But I'm interested in verse number 7. It said, Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. Can I say that seed did germinate? And that seed did take root. And that seed was trying to produce something in that ground. But that seed had a problem. The thorns. The thorns hindered the work of the seed. Can I say I see people that come to church. Brother Brian, I believe they want God 
do something in their life, and I believe they want to do something for Jesus, uh, but Miss Lisa, somewhere along the line, their desires and their actual being don't mesh. Something gets in the way of the seed doing the work in their life. Miss Marsh, this is what I want to preach on. I want to preach on active yet distracted. There are a lot of folks that are active that come to church, that read their Bible, that pray, that give their tithe, that uh, uh, are uh, 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 what uh, most pastors would say is a dream to have coming to church. They're active. But something distracts them. And they don't become productive. You know, in John 15, the Lord says it's ordained of the Lord that we bring forth much fruit. Now, I don't know the specific will of God, Brother Clint, for everybody's life, but I do know the will of God for everybody's life. Bring, for, bring, bring, bring fruitful. Bring forth fruit. Huh? Listen, Brother Brian, when you was in your sinning days, Brother Jim, when you was in your sinning days, you brought a lot of attention for the devil, to the devil. Your life said, sinner. When you got saved, your life ought to say, Christian. Uh, people ought to see a difference uh, and people ought to know that God is living and working in your life. Now, with that said, people ought to not think you're fake, nor should people run from you when they see you coming down the street. That means you're a weirdo. We're to be peculiar, but not a weirdo. You with me? Uh there's some crowd, I mean, they wear them neon signs, Jesus fan, and I mean, they got that looks in their eyes, and uh, they come down the street, I'm thinking, weirdo, I'm going across the other side of the street. But I can see somebody that loves Jesus, and I want to hang around that person. Maybe some of what they got to rub off on me. Can I say there are a lot of folks who are active, but something is causing them not to be fruitful. They're distracted. There's some thorns that are choking their fruitfulness. They're active yet distractive. And can, uh, distracted. Can I say this? Uh, of that 75 percentile, many are distracted, first of all, by the well watered plains of Jericho or of Jordan. The well watered plains of Jordan. You remember the story. Abraham was called by God to go out to a land that was not his country. And God told him, get up, leave his kindred, and go. And Abraham did. But just like a lot of us, Abraham didn't totally do what God said. He did mostly what God said. And Abraham just looked at his nephew and said, Lot, you want to go too? God didn't call Lot. He called Abraham and, and Sarah. But Abraham took Lot. Abraham was a wealthy man. Had a lot of cattle. Had a lot of herds. Had a lot of camels. Uh, had some goats. Uh, 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 had a lot of herdsmen to take care of all that. Uh, and so was Lot. Well, they got out there and their herdsmen got to fighting and feuding because uh, there wasn't enough uh, uh, water and uh, not enough grass to feed their herds. And so Abraham says, Lot, this is, by the way, after Abraham had to go rescue Lot because he got taken captive. Abraham had problems with Lot and his crowd the whole time. And any time you don't totally obey God, you're going to have problems too. Um, Abraham said, Lot, I'll tell you what. You choose what direction you want to go. I'll go the other direction. Lot gets to look around. He sees them well water plains of Jordan. He said, man, that looks like a nice place to raise a family. I'm headed that way. And he ended up in Sodom. Some of you got your eyes on some well-watered plains. Boy, they look like a good place to raise a family. Looks like a great place to raise some cattle. Looks like a great place uh, 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 to dwell. Uh, looks like, man, that's right where I need to be. The only one problem, you're liable to get down there. And what's offered down there might steal your family. 
might slaughter your cattle, might destroy what you're wanting to build. Are you listening? Uh, 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 hey, uh, just because it looks uh, like it's something that'll be a blessing uh, don't mean that it's God's blessing. Uh, that costs a lot. Can I say there are a lot of people who come to church, but their lives are full of misery because they went off after the well-watered plains of Jordan. A lot of folks serving God, but their family's not serving with them because their family's been seduced by Sodom or by Gomorrah. And their family's been seduced by a big city, big city life and not what, by what thus saith the Lord. I'm here to tell you tonight, there's some who are active, but they're distracted by those well-watered plains. You better be careful. I'm thinking of a family right now, a good family, used to be in this church. They left this church seeking a fortune, only to lose their family and be miserable tonight. Can I say they've been gone from here for more than a decade, and it wasn't until two weeks ago they finally found a church home. When they announced they's leaving, I pulled them in my office and I read them Ruth chapter number one. And the first thing I asked them, I said, "What church are you going to?" They said, "Well, we hadn't even looked for church." Then it's not God's will for you to leave. God'll never leave you from one good church to to, to go to where there is no church. And you mark her down. They sought a fortune. They sought dollars. And they lost their family. You better watch them well water plains. Hmm? You're liable to find out there's a drought down there too. Hmm? Uh, some are active, but they get distracted. I thought about this. Many are distracted, Brother Clint, by the pool from a far country. Uh, I'm reminded about Luke 15. There was a young man there had it made. His father was good to him. Hey, he had it made. But oh, there was a pull from a far country. And he went to his father. Huh? Can you imagine Joseph coming to you and say, Hey, Dad, give me the Chevelle. I'm heading out. Huh? Where you at, Joe? The Chevelle's Charles. Sorry. Huh? Yeah, you might get a moped. You know what I'm saying? Huh? Huh? He come and he wanted the portion of his inheritance that would befall him. The father wasn't even dead. And the boy's wanting his inheritance. What arrogance. And not many days after the father gave him a portion of his goods, in the reality, Brother Jim, Bible days, everything went to the eldest. He's the younger son. Biblically, he deserved zero. But the father was good to him. Not many days. He headed out for that far country. That pool just was too strong for him. Uh, went out there, uh, spent all he had and wasted it on riotous living. Uh, finds himself uh, 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 becoming a servant uh, and feeding the swine uh, and hungering after what the swine ate. Uh, now I know y'all think I'm a city guy. I was raised in the country. Uh, listen. I don't want what they feed swine. You ever been around when they throw that slop out there for them swine? That is not a good sight. Hmm? I, am, I, I can't believe I'm about to say this. I just about would eat Chinese food before I'd eat hog slop. You know what I'm saying? And I ain't eating either. I'll go to heaven as you know, like Gandhi, starving myself to death before I eat either one of them. Huh? Listen. That boy came to himself, said, My servants got my dad's servants got it better than I got it. And thanks be unto God, uh, he got up and went down that same road he left on. He ended up back up at the father's house and the father restored him. Uh, uh, but I'm here to tell you, uh, what did it cost him? Uh, hey, how many scars did he have the rest of his life? Uh, hey, uh, the bitterness of his elder brother. Uh, all of it was his own making. How many are sitting in the house of God and there's a pool from a far country? Boy, if you just come over here, you can live it up. 
Boy, we really got what you need. You get out, young people, you get out from underneath your, your parents' uh, uh, thumbs. Boy, you can have a time. Well, you can. But it's going to cost you everything you got. I knew a guy one time that was in manufacturing, and he was giving a tour to some Amish people. They come to see how things were done in that manufacturing plant. And they took a break, and while they took a break, he asked one of my Amish guys, he said, how do you keep your young people? He says, we lose some. He said, but they always come back. He said, why is that? He said, they just look at your young people and see what that's all about, and they ended up saying, no, we got better at our house. Uh, a lot of truth to that. Uh, young people, that world looks so wonderful. You're having the best time of your life right now. You, ought to better, you better get all you can from the Father's house. Hmm? Uh, there's some distracted by the pool from a far country. Can I say this? Some get distracted, Brother Tommy, from the, by the pride of Saul. It was never God's will for Israel to have a king. The king of kings was supposed to be Israel's king. But because of the hardness of their heart, they wanted to be like all the heathen nations, have a king. God gave them a king, gave them Saul. And Saul was a great king while he was little in his own eyes. But when he got lifted up with pride, he started serving false gods. He disobeyed God. And that pride was his demise. There's a lot of people get full of pride, sitting on a church pew full of pride. But Sam and I was talking about this. When you think the very thrice holy God of glory left heaven to come to this earth, that ought to humble us. I mean, just to come here amongst this sin-depraved world and then carry our sin up Calvary's mountain, that ought to humble us. Then allow him to beat him and spit on him and uh, nail him to the cross uh, and he shed his blood for us, that ought to humble us. Did you ever think about this? Did you ever think about when he washed his disciples' feet? The king of glory washed his disciples' feet. They called the crowd that washed the feet the towel crowd. It was the lowest, most base job you could have. Washing somebody's feet. Now, Miss Marcy, yours look pretty good tonight. Got the toes all painted up and everything. But I'm here to tell you, if you went out between now and Sunday and you did nothing but walk where all they're digging up all this mud and all this stuff and everything, and you walked through all that mud and that filth and that nastiness uh, and you developed big old blisters and calluses, and uh, your feet would look like Mary's. That's what they'd look like. But if you came in like that, That's what their feet looked like. They walked in sand, hot sand, everywhere they went. Uh, and they had nasty calluses. Uh, they didn't have nice pretty sandals like Miss Marcy's wearing. They had very base uh, uh, shoes. Uh, and uh, their, their feet would be hot and nasty. Uh, and they'd come in uh, and somebody uh, would get a towel person uh, uh, to wash their feet. That's as base as it got. And Jesus not only humbled himself and became obedient unto death, the death of the cross, he washed their feet. Think about that. He washed Judas' feet. Notice Judas had already sold him for 30 pieces of silver. He washed Ty Thomas' feet knowing he was going to doubt him. He washed Peter's feet knowing Peter was going to cuss him in just a few hours. Ah, uh, and when we think about our Lord Jesus doing that and then coming to where we were and convicting us of our sin and saving us from our sin and blessing us the way he has and walking with us and talking with us uh, and being good to us, uh, who are we to be filled with pride? He was our example. And carrying his name, we're to be Christ-like. He told us to esteem others better than ourselves. 
Now, I know missionary Baptists make that an ordinance of their church, washing feet. It isn't an ordinance of the church. It was the Lord showing an example of humility. But we ought to be willing to wash somebody's feet. If Jesus did it, we ought to be willing to do it. Now, don't bring me your nasty feet. I ain't washing them, okay? I'll tell you what I do. I'll give you a prime example. How many of you know Brother Wheeler? First time I met Brother Wheeler's in a camp meeting. And I looked down at Brother Wheeler's shoes, and there was a mess. And after service, I said, Preacher, when we get back to the hotel, I said, won't you give me your shoes? I'll polish them for you. I took his shoes. I took Brother Donald's. I took Brother Titus and Brother Lamont's shoes back to my hotel room. And I polished those men's shoes. I took them back down. I didn't know them from Adam. But I took their shoes back to him and said, Here, this was a privilege to get to do this for you gentlemen. We got to fellowship and in the hotel room. We stayed about three or four hours just talking about the goodness of God. And, the, and Brother Wheeler and I are good friends tonight. I wonder if we'd have that relationship if I'd have said, Man, what, what's that preacher doing? He's too, too lazy to polish his own shoes. What I've learned about Brother Wheeler is he spends so much time in prayer, they probably got all messed up when he was on his face for God praying for somebody. Hmm? Some are distracted by the pride of Saul. Can I say this? Too many are distracted tonight. Some are distracted by the pleading of Delilah. Samson lost his strength when she wore him down. If you're not careful, you'll find yourself in a situation. You'll give somebody your ear. You should never give your ear. They'll wear you down, and they'll rob you of your joy of the Lord. Mm. Oh, you can miss Wednesday night. Oh, you can miss Sunday night. No, you can miss Sunday school. Oh, you don't have to go then. You don't have to do this. You don't have to. And you listen to it long enough, they'll wear you down. The pleading of Delilah cost Samson more than his strength. Cost him his eyesight. Cost him his testimony. And eventually cost him his life. Better not get distracted, friend. I'll tell you something. The devil's got thorns everywhere. And if you get to focusing on the thorns, they'll choke you out. I thought about this. Some get distracted by the procrastination of David. By the time I could show you, there was the battle of the kings. It means all the kings showed up and fought. Now, there isn't anybody that knows anything about David and knows that he was a man's man. David was a warrior. David was not allowed to build the temple of God because he was a man of bloody hands. I mean, David, you look at him cross-eyed, he'd just take your head off. I mean, he was a warrior. But he decided one day, I'm going to take it easy. Friends, we get in trouble when we take it easy. Amos 6.12 says, Woe, or 6.1 says, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. When you get comfortable, that's when the devil gets you. He decides he's not going to the battle of the kings. He sends a regiment out there. He says, I'm just going to hang out the house. Walks out on the veranda looks over and sees Bathsheba taking a bath and he desires to have her. Next thing you know, he's having her husband murdered. Her husband was one of his greatest warriors. Hmm? Can I say, if you're not careful, you'll start procrastinating. You'll start taking it easy. And my dear friends, when you do, there's a Bathsheba out there to get you. By the way, I preached on this. Everybody feels sorry for her. They said, well, the king could have had her life taken from her. If she didn't submit, she still could have said no. She, said, she could have said, I'd rather die and be pure to my husband than to submit to the king. You're welcome. That didn't cost you anything. That's for all you women's libbers. Huh? But the, po the point of it 
says, you better be careful. All you got to do is keep back and say, well, you know what? I've been working for the Lord for so long. I think I'll take it easy and let somebody else do it. It's in danger, friend. I told a preacher not long ago, he was talking about retiring. I said, shoot, I think I got another 20 years in me before I get to thinking that way. The fellow's my age. Talking about retiring. I don't want to limp into heaven. I want to go out in a blaze of glory, don't you? Thought about this. Too many are distracted by the passion of money. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Money's not the root of all evil. You need money to survive. And by the way, Miss Nett told me what she spent at the grocery today. Lord have mercy. I'm going to have to get another part time job. Lord have mercy. Uh, and she only came back with one bag. I'm thinking, Lord have mercy. Oh, really? How are people on Social Security and fixed income going to make it? Gas, five, six dollars a gallon. A dozen eggs, three dollars. I remember when they were 59 cents, and that wasn't that long ago. Uh, she said two pounds of chicken. We had to get a mortgage for it. It's crazy. We're going to go back to eating spam and potted meat. Hallelujah. What a blessing. You throw enough mayonnaise on it, you can choke it down. And it's all better than Chinese. So hallelujah. But there's some people, they get consumed with things and having more toys and their their whole thought process is about money, 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 money. And it becomes their demise. You know, a lot of people used to be faithful to the house of God and then they started working overtime. Then they got a bass boat or they got a new set of golf clubs. You never see them on Sunday anymore. Well, I paid this much money for this thing. I got to get some use out of it, huh? Got distracted. There's a lot who's active. You had to get distracted. Thought about this lastly. Too many are distracted by the pleasures of sin. And there is pleasure in sin for a season. But I want to tell you something. There's a payday coming. That sin will find you out. When you've got to pay for that sin, the scars, my dear friend, they may heal, but they never go away. Sin will cost you a whole lot more than you thought it would. Hmm? It'll keep you longer than you thought it would, too. You know, uh, uh, Naomi and her husband, Limelech, they just said, well, we're in a famine, but we hear about bread down at Moab. Got down there, he died. She stayed. Both her boys died. She stayed. Stayed down there 10 years. That sounds like a bigger problem than just eating some bread. Sin always keeps you longer than you ever thought it would. Hmm? Say, well, I can quit anytime I want to. Well, quit. How come you ain't quit? Because you can't quit when you want to. There's pleasure in sin for seeing young people. There's a great rule to live by. If you never try it, You'll never know if you like it. Uh, so you just there's just some things you never need to know if you like or not. Hmm? Uh, but you do love Jesus, you just hang out with him. You can't do any better than him anyway. He's the best life you can ever have. And I've said all that to say this. The devil's got charms and lures and snares and darts and thorns and he'll use whatever he can to get your attention off of Jesus don't get distracted be active and fruitful friend when it's all said and done I believe this thing's winding down when it's all said and done and you stand before Jesus if you are active and fruitful he'll say well done thou good and faithful child he said enter into the joy of the Lord and that well done's worth more than all the gold in the world. Because you can't buy that. That comes from living a life that pleases the Lord. Be active. Hallelujah. Just don't get distracted. Be active and be fruitful. Say, Brother Doug, how can I be fruitful? Just be obedient to what God says. Just do what you can to honor Jesus. 
And if you honor him, you'll be fruitful. And your life will never be in vain. I want my life to count for Christ. How about you? I wonder tonight, have you been active and you've gotten a little distractive? Some of you aren't, aren't where you used to be. What's distracted you? Why don't you get your eyes back on Jesus tonight? Hmm? I'm glad our Lord's a Lord of second chances, third chances, fourth chances, fifth chances. I'm glad He cares for us. Uh, some of you just aren't where you used to be. Why don't you get back there? Why don't you get active and then become fruitful? Uh, some of you are fruitful. You ought to get in the altar and say, Lord, help me remain fruitful. Help me, Lord. I'm, I, I, I don't want to get my eyes off of you. Help me keep focused on you. Some of you tonight might need to come pray for Brother Eric. Pray God give him some help, some comfort. Maybe God put something else on your heart tonight to come pray for. You need to come pray for him. All right, so let's all stand. Miss Renee, you come. Brother Clint, get a song of invitation. Folks are coming to pray. God spoke to your heart. If you've got a little distracted, why don't you come? Get your eyes back on Jesus tonight. Folks are coming. They're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Well, thank you for the scriptures. Lord, if we're not careful, we'll be easy getting that 75 percentile. Lord, we don't want the word of God to bounce off our stony hearts. We want to be receptive. We want to be active in the things of God. We want to be fruitful. We want you to be pleased with our lives. God, I pray that you'd get so big in these people's lives that the crowd that uh, isn't good ground, Lord, they'd become good ground because they see what you're doing in these folks' lives. God bless now. Help these young people, Lord, to take this message to heart. And God, certainly speak to hearts. Get glory to your name. Bless this invitation. We'll thank you for it. For it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Turn Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.